Welcome to Global Perspectives. Where do music and national security meet? In the life of Jeff Baxter, formerly with the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan. He's here to tell his story. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks, sir. I really appreciate, really appreciate the invite. Tell us, uh, we, we have to know about your musical background first. So, so tell us that. I mean, everybody knows the groups. But how did, how did you get involved? Well, you wanted to be a journalist at one point, or am I? I wanted to be a DJ journalist, yeah. I went to the School of Public Communications at uh, BU for a year. Then left because somebody offered me a lot of money to be in a rock and roll band. So, it, it, yeah. yeah, tough decision, right? <clears throat> Started piano when I was five. Uh, parents gave me a guitar when I was nine. I wanted a bicycle, so I just hung it on the wall. And then Ryan when I was a little after that, Nine and a half, somebody showed me some chords and I realized I just sort of found Valhalla, Nirvana, all of that stuff. And did it happen quickly or Well, fast because of the piano, the musical background, it really, those, those doors had already been opened. It was just a question of which chariot I was going to ride. And uh, it turned out to be the guitar. And I was in, living in Mexico City at the time uh, with my parents and Next thing I knew, I knew three chords and I was in a rock band and a friend of mine, a friend of mine of a friend of mine, we took our band up to the big radio station there and played a song and they cut a disc and started playing it. And next thing I knew, we were doing gigs. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> no union. <laughs> so, so money was coming in, you figured that that was paving the way to your to your Well, and the future. money was coming in, you know, I mean, we were, I was 11 years old, you know. They, we were doing it for drinks and a couple of bucks. And there was no real drinking age at the time, back in the 60s. Um, but it, it, the guitar really had drawn, drawn me in. And then when I went to prep school in, in, the, in the US, first thing I did was find like-minded people and start, formed a band. And um, they tried to throw me out of school for you know, things that you do when you're that age. but. We formed a band, so we started playing at all the girls' schools, and we became pretty popular, so nobody could throw us out of school. And uh, I still, to this day, uh, keep in touch with some of those musicians, excellent players. So, so tell us a little bit about the origins of Steely Dan. How, how did that magically come together? Well, um, I was in Boston at the time, uh, doing a lot of session work, both in New York and Boston, uh, and I was working uh, at uh, Intermedia Sound, and there was a band that I knew very well uh, called The Bead Game that was being produced by Gary Katz. And Gary had heard my guitar playing and said, we are doing a project in New York with a young lady named Linda Hoover, and there are these two guys that are writing all the songs for it, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan. Uh, can you come down to New York and uh, work on this project? I said, sure. And after it was over, I had said, wow, this music is incredible. And they said, well, we never heard anybody that could play guitar on it like that. So we formed a pact. Whoever got the first job, you know, everybody else would follow. So uh, Becker and Fagan went out to Los Angeles and got a publishing deal with ABC Records with Gary Katz. And uh, so we all trundled out there. And uh, actually, we were rehearsing in Jay Lasker's office, the president of ABC Records, and we tried to get out there, out of the office in time before he showed up. But one night, you know, there's too many beers and everything, so finally we're, we're all passed out on the floor and the place is a mess. And he walks in and says, what the hell is this? He said, oh, we're, we're a band. And, he, and Jay was smart enough to say, okay, play something for me. And he liked it, signed the band, <laughs> you know, in his office. So that's how Steely Dan got started. And, and you were inebriated and it still came out great? Well, no, I mean, it was, uh, it was the morning after. Oh, the so morning we after. Were so not, uh, we probably should have been. We were pretty, you know, pretty hungover at the time. But it was our, it was our shot. You never know. You've got to be ready. So we played three or four songs for him. And he really liked the band's music. And he thought that uh, he wanted to sign us. So Howard Stark and Jay Lasker, the president and vice president, you know, I like what you guys are doing, you know. And uh, uh, Howard wrote me a check for $1,000, and I thought, my God. That was. Oh. He said, 
you know, get your girlfriend out here, bring her out, get an apartment. You know, I'm thinking, I just hit the big time. Little did I realize. But okay, that's why you have attorneys and stuff. But, and to their credit, uh, it was a very strange band, but they had a vision and they signed us and they supported us. So um, that's kind of how it got started. And then after that, you just rode this incredible ride for a long, long time. It was, yeah, it was about two or three years. Um, and in, it, while I was doing that, I was also, uh, knock on wood, a very successful studio musician. So I just brought it out to LA. So I was working a lot in the studios and uh, playing at the Palomino Club, playing steel guitar in a country band, and uh, touring with Linda Ronstadt. And, and so just taking every gig that there was. So it was a, a musical potpourri. A uh, real sh smorgasbord for a guy like me. It was good. Linda Ronstadt always sounded so natural, like everything just came to her easily. Was that the case from your experience? or? Well, she had the benefit of good producers, Peter Asher, and good musicians, guys in the band, uh, the, the, the Stone Ponies, and we were sort of the second iteration. Uh, uh, the drummer from uh, Little Feet, myself, uh, John Boylan on piano, uh, Andrew Gold on guitar. I mean, it was really a killer band. Uh, the problem was it was so killer that we basically steamrolled her off the stage. So she said, I love you guys, but you know, I, I gotta get something a little less, a little less energetic. But there was so much work at the time, plenty of work. So Steely Dan did make a name for itself. And then Steely Dan started opening on tour for the Doobie Brothers. And uh, the Doobies asked me if I'd sit in for a couple of songs, and then it was four songs, and then it was half the show. And then I was out on tour with the Doobies when uh, Becker and Fagan decided they didn't want to tour anymore. So I literally hung up the phone and said, well, that's it for Steely Dan. And I said, well, now you're in the Doobie Brothers. So kind of a quick transition. And um, life kept on going, just got better and better and better. Brought Mike McDonald into the Doobies, and uh, because uh, Tom Johnson at the time was having some health problems, and I thought, okay, got to make a command decision. Just take a shot, see what happens. Sent him a one-way ticket, and um, that worked out okay. So I am one of the luckiest guys in the world. I get to uh, to defend my country on the weekdays, and I get to play rock and roll on the weekends. Well, tell us about that defending the, the country piece. You, you always had a natural inclination toward technology. And Most you, guitar players are diode heads. If it lights up, yeah, I gotta have one and plug it into something else. So how did that translate into a connection to f f national security, military uh, well, defenses I, and such? Well, I was working for a number of companies, Fender, Akai, Roland, uh, and at the, that time was the beginning of the digital revolution, if I guess you'd call it, where uh, analog was was giving way to the new digital uh, formats, uh, both in video and audio and in music reproduction. So to me, the best source for the new technologies was reading defense magazines, Jane's and uh, Defense Weekly, and, and just any publication that came out of the government and military because it was, there was always something in there about cutting edge technology. So I guess it just caught them all built up in back of the dam and my dad always said, if you have a good idea, you write it down. So as I said in the, uh, on uh, the NBC thing, I sat down to my Tandy 200, <laughs> which dates me, uh, and wrote a paper on, uh, converting the Aegis uh, air defense system for the Navy to do theater missile defense and gave it to a congressman, buddy of mine, who gave it to the vice chairman of the Armed Services Committee who said, what is this guy from Raytheon or Boeing? No, he's a guitar player for the Doobie Brothers. So next thing I knew, I said, would you accept a position as a, on the c civilian advisory board for the Armed Services Committee on missile defense? I said, yeah, I guess so. I had no idea what it really entailed. Strapped to the chair, yes, uh, yeah, well, me and Joe Walsh and all the things that we did, and you got to confess. You know, it's kind of like, uh, I guess it's own theology. And next thing I knew, I was at Lawrence Livermore uh, working on Star Wars, and I was at the Missile Defense Agency, or SDIO, 
at the time working for uh, General Mal O'Neill and then later uh, General Lyles and Ron Kadish and, and Trey Obring. And that opened doors to a whole bunch of other things where I'm, a, I'm probably a little nuts. Uh, so the way that I approach problem solving was a little different than I guess many of the folks that I was working with and found myself uh, in some very interesting areas. You're an idea person, and some of the people who've worked with you describe you as your own idea factory, which is a which is a wonderful compliment. All right, thank you. And um, wickedly sharp and perceptive when you set your mind to something. Those are not the types of terms that are usually describing used to describe people. Um, but how did you get to the point where you are an idea factory and wickedly perceptive <laughs> in terms of your? Well, approaches? thank you for the compliment. I. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I do know that, uh, and certainly from what I've learned in my, in my later life, that athletics and music are the only way that you could really reprogram your brain to do nonlinear thinking and to look at in analytics from a, a nonlinear perspective. They don't teach it in school. But musicians are excellent at it because they can do a number of things in parallel, and athletes do the same thing. And I used to tell people that if you think a basketball player is just a basketball player, watch what he does. He's a wrestler. He is a tactician. He's an artillery officer, actually a naval artillery officer, because he's looking to hit the target while he's moving and doing all the ballistic calculations. I mean, there's so much more to this than what you sort of see. And with musicians, it's the same thing. Uh, tempo, time, melody, chords, uh, lyric, all of the things that are operating in parallel, you have to be somewhat capable of working on a, on a multi-level platform to be able to do that. So I think it kind of came naturally. Uh, and then when I started to apply it to the national security area, I, I found I had a few uh, supporters. People who understand the issues would automatically have what you are saying resonate with them. But what about people who are skeptics? What are people who are saying, well, wait a minute, he's a musician, he sounds like us, but what, what did you use to make that connection between the two so that maybe some of the skeptics I think a lot of it was became... music. Uh, again, uh, many of the people that I worked with uh, were Doobie Brothers fans. I mean, that's how I met uh, uh, Bob Wark. Uh, at uh, um, Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, US, at uh, um, their, the, the conference, uh, I was introduced to Bob Work, and the first thing, Deputy Secretary of Defense, first thing he said was, uh, I'm a big Steely Dan fan. So Captain Stupid here said, uh, oh, so how would you like to be on my red team at the Schriever Games? And he goes, everybody goes, what are they? So he sticks out his hand and says, send me an invite. So I sent him an invite. So he shows up. So you know, I, I'm too stupid to know what I can't, I can't do. So I found that as I worked my way through the national security arena, more and more people were interested in meeting based on their familiarity with the music. And then uh, once you got going, I mean, you have to walk the walk, obviously. But when uh, the opportunities came, and I, I guess I must have satisfied my, uh, my peers and my keepers because um, 20 years into it, and I'm still doing it. Yeah. Is there a piece of it, uh, again, generally, I'm not interested in the specifics, but is there a piece of it that you enjoy more than others? Yeah, I, I really enjoy the unconventional side of things. Unconventional warfare, unconventional technologies, uh, readapting, uh, uh, force multiplying, uh, looking at, at future warfare and, and well, as von Clausewitz said, war is, and diplomacy are sort of a, you know, a fluid, you know, they, they morph into each other. So the whole concept of national security, diplomacy, warfare, and the, the interaction and the dynamics of human conflict and how much it's changed. Uh, the, the, the internet and the whole cyber world has completely changed warfare. I mean, it is the Manhattan Project. It is. It is a new version of nuclear weapons. P pretty much as destructive, probably doesn't kill as many people, although that depends. Um, but w 
the, the challenge, I guess, of trying to figure out how to go from point A to point B through point M or on whatever layers, that fascinates me. Because to me, it's like music. It's running hard on a multi-level uh, platform. So it comes naturally. And when Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd, the man who invented the OODA loop, uh, wrote about creation and destruction, analysis and synthesis, I went, that's what musicians do. That's exactly what they do. So I now feel a little bit more comfortable, can explain myself a little better, and um, knock on wood, so far, I'm still uh, solving problems. I do a lot of red teaming. For those who may not be familiar with that term, could you just describe briefly what red teaming is? Oh, the OODA loop? Mm -hmm. uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. Although some people would say it's observe, obfuscate, destroy, and apologize, depending on which agency you work for. But it was a very simple template to apply to any problem to get you started. And uh, it's now a part of doctrine, either utilizing the OODA loop, the OODA loop yourself, or understanding how your adversary is using it and then being able to get inside their decision-making cycles and get inside that algorithm to um, hopefully defeat your adversary. So how would you describe the current environment in which we live? Some people think it's the most problematic, dangerous world we've ever had. Some think it's just a modern version of a world that's always been dangerous. Uh, but it, it's certainly something that is a challenge, even to someone with, with your background and creativity. Well, I mean, if you start to look at phases, I guess, as soon as uh, infantry got on a horse. That all of a sudden changed the dynamics and the speed of warfare. Uh, and then as soon as warfare became uh, multidimensional on the sea as well as on the land, that created another kind of, of warfare and, and a different tempo. Um, and pretty much everything was sort of Napoleonic uh, meaning that it was you know land warfare supported by the Navy, or, and then all of a sudden the airplane comes along, and now the distances that were uh, uh, a part of warfare uh, shortened simply because you could get there faster, and you could see things and you could get there faster, and <laughs> right now. We have gone in, and of course, nuclear weapons changed a lot because the destructive power was so uh, devastating that it stopped people a little bit, uh, made them think a little bit about making the next step. But we've really morphed into a whole other world where it used to be oceans would protect you, land masses would protect you, even against airplanes, it still took you some time to get from A to B. The electron travels at the speed of light. And now, in the cyber world, you can destroy a country, you can take something down in nanoseconds, almost before the other person realizes what's happening. So Sun Tzu wrote 2,500 years ago that the successful general is the one that wins the battle before the army even comes to the field. Well, the use of the electron and cyber is the perfect uh, uh, opportunity for that. So that's the biggest change, the speed the velocity of warfare is now in nano, pentoseconds, femtoseconds, very different. Is that your biggest concern versus other types of threats, asymmetrical warfare capabilities Absolutely. and things like that? The whole, the whole concept of asymmetrical warfare is why I'm on the red teams so much and why I do that because it very much worries me. Um, are most of the military uh, folks around the world, they're good folks, they're patriotic to their country, they're uh, very smart, but usually they're fighting the last war uh, simply because it's what they know. Uh, they're not really, most of the folks in the military around the world, except for a few, never really understood the power of the electron. They just 
again, bombers, ships, you know, artillery, uh, and watching people adapt to it, some faster than others, is what's changing the world. Uh, during the, uh, the Cold War, you were either a Russian ally or, or Soviet ally or a U.S. ally, and everybody was split down the middle. And nobody could really wage war other than the two superpowers because nobody really had the, the strength, especially in nuclear weapons. Now, one guy with an iPhone somewhere in Somalia can take down a third of the U.S. power grid. That's a completely different concept. And it's hard for some people to get their head around. Well, how do you get your head around it in your status as an idea factory of one? Um, is there a process that you go through? Is anything daunting to you, or do you think you have the capability because you are so perceptive, you are able to think about and fight the next war rather than the last one? Do you feel that you have an edge that others don't have? Well, first, you're too kind. Thank you for the compliment. I base it on the fact, like I said before, I'm too stupid to know what I can't do. So I figure it's all possible. Until somebody can, instead of saying, I know that this can't be done, and I'm gonna to try to find a way around it, I approach it from it, I figure it can be done. And somebody explained to me why it can't be. That's, I guess, the premise that I would say I start from. If you're thinking about a problem, a national security problem that you'd like to fix, and one that is also a top priority, what, what would that be? And um, would you be optimistic about being able to fix it? Well, the good news is everybody screws up. And there are certain countries and certain adversaries and certain folks that have thought this through more than others have. Um, certainly there are some countries that have a much longer view of history than we do. Uh, I'm afraid that in the United States, um, Certainly, we are the epitome of George Satayana's statement, those who don't learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it, because a lot of people, matter of fact, most people don't know their history. Uh, they, and they don't understand that it's not, you know, 13-week cycles, quarterly reports. It's hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years. And so, that sounds like it might be a dichotomy in terms of warfare in nanoseconds, but it really isn't because a lot of nanoseconds make up a thousand years. So if you're comfortable looking at conflict from a long haul or from nanoseconds, if you're comfortable in both arenas, that's where you, that's where you win. Again, and that gets you back to thinking on multi-levels and that gets you thinking about warfare from all cardinal points, not just driving your tanks down the full the gap, but everything, including uh, how you do perception management, perception engineering for a whole population. I mean, uh, Adolf Hitler certainly was a, a master at that. Joseph Goebbels was a master at that. Uh, the idea that the communication part of it and the staging of it uh, was as important as uh, killing somebody with a bullet. As a matter of fact, it was more important. So the, the, the use of motivation, and what is motivation? Motivation is affecting somebody in such a way that you get their brain to secrete a specific drug cocktail that creates a mood. Uh, do you want somebody to be happy? Well, how much serotonin can I pump into your brain? Do I want to make you afraid? How much adrenaline can I get going quick, quickly? Would I like you to fall in love? How much oxytocin can I get into you? Uh, all chemicals that are cr created by the brain. And I learned a lot of this when I was doing movie soundtracks. I understood, um, I think I understand the basics and the physics of what music, which is coherent oscillations according to my old friend Charlie Towns who won the Nobel Prize for the laser, that's how he described it. I said, Charlie, that's what music is. He said, absolutely the ability to stimulate the human brain to create whatever cocktail is that you want. I mean, I can sit here with a, a guitar and in 50, 15 seconds take you through fear, happiness, uncertainty, uh, you know, uh, a number of different emotions simply by basically triggering 
uh, uh, different sort of brain cocktails. Now, if you can do that on a national level, now you're talking about all cardinal point warfare on a grand scale. You're not only trying to go after the physical person, you're actually now going after the mental part of it. And we're gonna to get to the point where as soon as somebody figures out how to map the human brain, we, nobody has to go to war anymore. I just fill a room with digital entities and I wait a half an hour and then you just do whatever I tell you to do. Because killing is, what, what, once you're into the, the killing part of it, it that means you've, you've run out of options. There are a lot more options. A lot more options. Well, Jeff Baxter, thank you for your service. Well, and thank you very much for having me here. And it's been a great day, by the way, meeting all your friends and working with your folks. Pretty cool group. It's exciting. And thank you for your music. I appreciate that. And thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for your hospitality. Thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.